Welcome. In this video, I'll be taking you through the second part of Chapter 30 in your online cooking textbook, introducing you to the bake shop with different mixing methods, a baking process, what happens during that process, and different nut identification. To start with the various mixing methods, beating is where you are mixing the product, such as this picture here with eggs. You are mixing the product vigorously to somewhat incorporate air, but mainly to break down that product and to transpose it from, let's say, the dark, deep yellow to a light and more creamy yellow for the egg yolk. Blending then, as you can see down below, usually involves a blender, uh, a mixer of some sort or a food processor to where you are vigorously, again, blending the ingredients together and pureeing them at the same time. Creaming then, which we'll talk more about in our quick bread section, the creaming method involves, as you can see on the top right, where you take the fat and sugar and you mix it together. Here is with a, a home use hand set of beaters, but they are incorporating the fat and the sugar to trap air and make it a nice creamy smooth substance, fluffy and light. As opposed to down below here, you can see cutting in the fat. Instead of letting this butter soften here and cream it to trap the air in, here we want to make sure that the butter is completely cold. If it's cut small going into it, your work is already halfway done. This is a pastry blender that is actually blending and cutting in the fat into the flour. So that way it's not making it one smooth mass. Instead, it's leaving pieces of that fat while still working in the majority into the flour. Then we have folding. This is probably the worst thing for a chef to have to do in the baking world. This is where you are taking whipped egg whites that you've taken your time now to get a really nice air incorporated and nice stiff peaks. And now you are folding it in gently by taking, you can see in the first picture, taking those egg whites on it. And with the spatula, you're just going to be folding the product over top of each other, not stirring and mixing and, and getting it all deflated. But instead, you just continuously fold it over top of each other to get it nicely incorporated. Things like mousses, Bavarian creams. Uh, there's a lot of products that really need and rely on this folding method. And then probably the exact opposite is kneading, um, which again brings the chef back to happiness to where we actually are taking the dough, folding it in half, using the palm of our hand and pushing it out away from us and then turning the product about halfway around, folding it again and pushing it out. So when we talk about biscuits in our next section, that's something we wanna make sure we don't overly need. But if we want something like a French bread, we're gonna need this till it's smooth and elastic. We'll talk about that with our yeast dough section. Then remember the more that you work the product, especially with doughs, the more the gluten is gonna develop if you're talking about a flour from the wheat berry. Then we have sifting at the top. Sifting really has two purposes. It's to eliminate any lumps and to incorporate air. So if a baking formula, as most will say, to sift dry ingredients, think about the purpose of it. If you're making something like blueberry muffins and you're going to just mix it and with the liquid and incorporate the lumps anyways, uh, but you're really deflating any air and you're, you're making lumps. There's no sense in sifting but something like an angel food cake to where you have your egg whites and you're folding in your dry ingredients. Absolutely, you want it to be sifted. You want it perfectly fine, as well as you want some air incorporated in it for that type of recipe. There's really about three or four recipes I can think of as a chef that I need to sift. But in the baking world, it just goes along with how everything is measured exact and is very refined in the process. You can see on the bottom right, the stirring is really just a matter of combining the ingredients together. Over on the bottom left, you have whipping. Whipping is where you are vigorously incorporating air. So if you were to be taking this spatula here and stirring these same egg whites, you would be stirring all day and nothing would happen. But by switching to a whisk and whisking vigorously, you're, you're beating air into it. And then you've changed these simple egg whites now to the foam that you see on the bottom left. So that would be a representation of stiff peaks there to where it's holding that shape when you pull that whisk out of the product. So what happens during this baking process? So let's take cookies as a simple example. When we go and put these cookies in the oven,
the first things that start to happen are those gases are going to form. If you have chemical leaveners, those gases could have already started forming. But at this point with the heat, it's really going to get the carbon dioxide flowing. Um, the air is going to, to start, you know, trying to escape and find its way out. The steam that is caused uh, by, the, by the moisture in the products is also going to help it to rise. Those gases, hopefully then, are trapped within that dough, within that product, within that cookie, by the gluten strands that are found within that flour. Again, if you're making a gluten-free cookie, there's no structure there to hold it in. You're hoping the protein, the eggs, that may trap it in, but it's not going to do as good of a job as gluten will. Again, think of these as rubber band strands stretching and stretching and won't burst. It's going to hold in all of those gases and really allow that cookie to rise and have a ni nice fluffiness to it. Your starches are going to start to gelatinize. So that could be within your flour. Uh, it could be some other thickeners that you add in there. And then your proteins coagulating at that 160 degrees. So protein starting to cook and really kind of bind your product together. Your fats will start to melt, again, giving off more steam and moisture, keeping them nice and flavorful. Water will start to evaporate. It'll cause more steam, but those it'll allow that sugar to start caramelizing really about 320 degrees. And depending on your products, but the cookies, that's what we're looking for, that brown on the cookie. So you're looking for that caramelization to happen, and that's your indication that they're done. Now keep in mind, all these baked products still have carryover baking or carryover cooking. still applies here. And that the idea that if you have cookies coming out of the oven, if you leave them on a hot tray, they'll continue to cook further versus leaving them rest for about a minute and then transferring them off of that tray to fully cool. Um, just remember that there will be a slight carryover as you take your products out. You may take a cake out that looks perfect and you'll come back to it and it and it really pulled away from the pans as though it's overcooked just by the carryover baking happening in that pan. And then also it's important to, to note that baked goods should not be refrigerated. Um, that will cause them to, to become stale a lot quicker. So keeping everything out at your room temperature or freezing it immediately would really trap in a lot of that freshness depending on what the baking products are. I'm going to then now move into nuts. And in this chapter, it does cover the variety of different nuts to identify with them. It's important to note that a true nut then is a single seed of a fruit surrounded by a hard shell. So there are true nuts, but then there also are some that still fall in this category, but would maybe have two sides, two seeds to that kernel. So let's start off with almonds. Almonds are pictured here at the top. Uh, these are whole almonds in the shell and then cracked, and you'll see that it is a single seed kernel here. So we're talking about a true nut with the almonds. Almonds can come in the whole variety with the skins on. They can come slivered, which is thin, uh, thin I would say, little sticks. Uh, you have slices with or without that skin on as well. Uh, again, you can get them roasted in a variety of different flavors. They did originate in Western India, but now there is a, a large amount grown um, and harvested in California. Brazil nuts here, these uh, are a little tougher to find, but if you look in the grocery stores, the kind of help yourself to the variety of nuts and put them in your own bag area, they have a lot of Brazil nuts mixed in with the mixed nuts. So even though they're usually a pretty expensive item, you can end up getting some of them relatively inexpensive in this mix. Uh, they do have a high oil content, and it's more of a tropical nut, so you'll find them in your Central and South America uh, regions. Cashews, then, pictured here off to the right. The cashew has that curved shape, almost reminds me of a cheese puff, but not even close when you're looking at it in, in real life. Uh, it does have a poisonous shell. It's grown in the Amazon. So as it's harvested and before it's sold, it does need to be removed from that shell. Chestnuts then um, have a actually like a three-sided shell to them. They are a true nut uh, and they have to be cooked. And a lot of times they're sold in the grocery store in bags already cooked and then um, almost you know dried similar to you would find like a raisin or a dried apricot. Uh, they have you know more of a, a dried texture to them being that they're already cooked, they're kind of that sponginess. Um, coconuts then come from a tropical coconut palm tree. Here it is in the fresh form, but there's a lot of variety of different coconut products as well. And then you have hazelnuts at the bottom. Your hazelnuts are another true nut. Um, they're native to the, the northern hemisphere. Northern hemisphere. 
Um, you do find them in your filbert paste or praline paste, it might be called. Uh, filbert's just another name for the hazelnut. So here you can see the full nut. Um, and then you have, again, with it cracked open, a lot of times it has that brown outer skin on them. The uh, most economical way is, again, at your grocery stores in the kind of bag your own bulk nuts and candy section. That's where you can find these hazelnuts at a really good price. The macadamia nuts. Macadamia nuts are uh, very popular in Australia as well as Hawaii. They do need to be shelled as their shells are extremely difficult uh, to get off. So they will be shelled before they are sold. Peanuts are included here, although peanuts are a dry legume or a type of legume. Um, they are not a nut by any means and that they grow underground. So here's a picture over here to where you can see that they're actually growing underground and dug up here. This would be the peanuts hole in their shell and then when they're, when they're shelled. They are native to South America. Um, they were brought to the United States through the slave trade. Again, an extremely popular nut, so to say, even though it is technically a legume. And then you have your pecans. Here, the pecans, it actually comes with the two, um, two halves here to the fruit um, surrounded by that shell. Pecans are extremely popular in the Mississippi area. You have pine nuts. Pine nuts are coming from a specific type of pine tree. Uh, you have pistachios. Actually, I want to go back to these pine nuts. Uh, very popularly used in your pastos, as well as then just a nice garlic roasted or confit, um, and then on top of pizza or, again, you know, garnished in different salads. Uh, it has a really great, great flavor. Pistachios here, as soon as they are ripened, um, then and then roasted, you'll see that they start to pop open for you. So it is very difficult to get raw pistachios. Typically, they will all be roasted, and then whether they're salted or not. Uh, they are native to Central Asia, but now grown in California as well. Um, you can buy them in the shell, or you can have them already out of the shell. It's about a 45% yield to taking or buying them already in the shell and then removing them. So that's an important factor when you're looking at your cost there as well. And then walnuts. Uh, and we grow walnuts here in Pennsylvania. Um, there's a large variety of walnuts. Black English walnuts are some of your most common ones. And they can be found all around the world here. And this concludes the end of Chapter 30 on the Introduction to the Bake Shop. Thank you.